So friends, we continue our worship series, Identifiable, right? How are we cultivating um, a relationship with one another, the church, with our faith that produces something, that has an outcome? How can we take on an identity and flourish as Christ followers? That's sort of our worship series for the next several weeks. Last week, I talked about curiosity and how we must cultivate a curious spirit within our church so that we can kind of live the life that God desires us to live. Next week, I'm going to talk about generosity. Yes, generosity. We're gonna, don't just save it for our stewardship campaign. So that's where we're headed today, though, we look at kindness and why the simple act of being kind can literally change everything. And a failure I think to demonstrate kindness then has serious ramifications for ourselves, for our spiritual development, and for our community. And make no mistake, I really do believe kindness is a universal virtue that exists at the heart of every major religion. In fact, kindness is not inherently faith-based. You don't have to follow Jesus to be kind. But if you do follow Jesus, you better be kind. Because kindness is indeed a divine virtue, one that shapes our worldview, our social perspective, our spiritual life. And without kindness, we will never become the committed disciples that God desperately wants us to be. And here I think then it's important for us to define how we're going to approach kindness or what kindness is. For me, at least this morning, kindness is seeing the Imago Dei or the image of God in every single person. The Imago Dei, an anthropological, theological term that simply says every single human being has the imprint or stamp of the divine because we are created in the image of God. That's what our holy scriptures say. Everyone then is a beloved child of God and everyone is loved by their creator. And kindness is seeing that first before we see anything else. The Imago Dei exists in all of us. Democrats and Republicans Honduran undocumented migrants, unhoused neighbors, annoying and petty neighbors, co-workers that are awful, strangers in the grocery store, petty bosses, sweet grandmothers, regardless of whether or not children will blow them kisses. <laughs> right? Every single person, including Philadelphia Eagles fans, they all have the Imago Day imprinted into their fiber and being kindness then is acknowledging that and then acting as if that were true. And we practice kindness not to simply be a nice person, but to shape and form us to do then the difficult work that the gospel calls us to do. Our text this morning instructs us to do, to be radically kind. And in fact, as we begin this process of practicing kindness, we begin to reshape the ways of the world. We'll be in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 31. And I invite you to rise and body your spirit for the reading of the gospel. Jesus continues his sermon saying, But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. 
You may be seated. This text in Luke is in the early section, the first half of Jesus' sermon on the plain. And I've said this to you all before, but it's worth repeating, right? In Matthew, Jesus is elevated on a mountainside, perched above those who have gathered to hear him preach, much like me standing at a pulpit. He is elevated above the crowd. But here in Luke, Jesus isn't elevated, but he is among the people looking at them in the eye, delivering a sermon that shares many, many traits with the one in Matthew, but there are some key differences, right? Because in Matthew, we see Jesus spiritualizing the Beatitudes, while Luke humanizes them. In Matthew, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But as Jesus is looking at the crowds eye to eye in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus simply says, blessed are the poor. So Luke is taking then the ministry of Jesus and firmly planting it among the people. If the Gospel of Mark is about a concise and clear picture of Christ, then the Gospel of John is about constructing a theological narrative. And the Gospel of Matthew is trying to convince a group of people that Jesus Christ is indeed the one they've been waiting for. But here in the Gospel of Luke, the entire Gospel of Luke is simply about connecting Jesus to humanity. It is the Gospel of Incarnation. So here in the text, right after the Beatitudes, Jesus moves into a piece of scripture that reminds us, I think, if we're honest, it reminds us of how difficult this being connected to others really is, right? Because loving your enemies isn't how we see the world, right? Clearly, the world is filled with hate and violence, with the powerful and powerless, with haves and have-nots, with winners and losers. In a world dominated then by the myth of scarcity, we can easily, I think, fall into this posture where we are only, we are only looking out for ourselves. I remember, as many... Of you do, right? I remember when the pandemic had just started taking effect here in the United States and impacting our lives. I was at the Dallas Mavericks game the night that the NBA suspended its season. And I remember how wild of an event that was. A few days later, I remember being in the Albertsons at Casa Linda, blown away by the amount of people that had crowded that store and how bare the shelves were. A few days later, I was in the church where I was a pastor. It was 11 o'clock at night. It was empty and it was quiet and we had just shuttered the building, suspended in-person worship, and essentially stopped all programming. I was in the building, I was in the church because I was desperately looking for hand sanitizer. <laughs> and I knew where it was. So I remember grabbing some of those bottles and I remember sitting in my office and it was, we were just starting to see the images come in from Italy. And I remember being so afraid. I was scared like I had never been in my entire life. And it was at, in my office at the church that I started to feel like I was losing it, you know. I was sitting on the couch and looking at those images, and I started, no lie, I started Googling on my phone how to buy a handgun. Which, if you knew me back in the day, I was an annoying pacifist. I'm still a big believer in the nonviolent ways of Jesus and I don't own a gun, and yet I was so anxious, I was so fearful, I was so overcome by the situation we found ourselves in that I couldn't stop myself from thinking about social and economic collapse and how 
I was ill-prepared to protect myself, my family, and that stuff that I own. We, even with the best of intentions, revert to this worldview that we are to protect what we have at all costs. And scarcity, then, is a powerful, intoxicating way to order the world. Jesus' words in Luke 6, then, when we are starting from this position of scarcity and fear and anxiety, the words of Jesus in Luke 6 then become impossible. Volve your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Yeah, what kind of hippie, idealized world is Jesus fantasizing about? What does that even look like in today's world? Loving your enemies. Especially when this week we saw the body cam footage coming out of Memphis. And a clear and constant reminder that black folks in our society continue to be the target of state-sponsored violence. What does loving your enemies and turning your other cheek look like in today's world? You want me to do what, Jesus? The challenge of Jesus' words are in their seemingly impractical application. How are we then to love in a world filled with so much hate? And are we instructed, really instructed, to make ourselves this vulnerable? Does Jesus really mean that to follow him literally requires us to take up our cross? The most common way we deal with this in Luke 6, then, is by saying Jesus wasn't really being serious. (laughs) Jesus wasn't being literal. And we kind of shrug it off and set it to the side. But friends, there is no spiritual growth in taking that path. There is no life on that path. There is no discipleship when we reduce the instructions of Christ to impracticalities and wishful thinking. And so we, as a people of First Church, we cannot simply write it off, even if we fall short of what it instructs us to do. Even if our response to fear and to anger, to injustice and to violence is simply this, I don't know. We have to find, though, a way forward, which then brings us to kindness. As Wesleyans, we believe that sanctification is a process in which the Holy Spirit is moving and pushing or pulling us towards Christian perfectionism. Simply put, we believe that it is possible by God's grace through the power of the Holy Spirit to actually get better at following Christ. We do not stay in one spot. We move on a journey towards better following Christ day in and day out. And so when Jesus says that we are to love our enemies, we may see that as an impossible task, but God sees the possibility even when we do not. So instead of throwing our hands up when Jesus says hard things, let's see the verses in chapter 6 as the end goal, the final destination, the sanctification then of our Christian life. And let's put it in its proper place. Which if you're like me, it is way over there. (laughs) Kindness, though, then becomes the tool or the mechanism we use to get from where we are to way over there. Kindness shapes and reworks our lives so that we begin to see others as God sees them, as beloved children first. It is a divine practice of acting as if Jesus was indeed speaking truth. When we begin acting out of this identity, when the golden rule is more than just be a nice person, when kindness becomes the divine weapon or tool we draw upon to reshape the world bit by bit, 
piece by piece, we begin to see God at work at every possible opportunity in our lives. Being kind, then, is a necessity if we want to arrive at the place that Jesus wants his followers to get to. And unfortunately, this kindness, this seeing the Imago Dei in each and every person, is universal in its application. We are called to see this in our co-workers, our neighbors, our families, to those we disagree with, to those we don't know, to those we can't even stand. If we begin to see the Imago Dei in others, we will begin moving to a deep fault position that is rooted in kindness. But here's the awesome thing about kindness. It isn't just reserved for our own edification. It also can impact and transform the ones who then receive our kindness. My buddy and I landed in Amman, Jordan after three and a half weeks of backpacking around Southeast Asia. We were still in the first half of our backpacking trip and already we were exhausted. Bangkok will do that to you. We landed early hoping to grab some food and crash in our hostel. And of course, we found out that our hostel in Amman, Jordan wasn't going to open for another six hours. So here we are wandering the streets of Amman with our backpacks on, desperately looking for food. So we looked at our trusty Lonely Planet guidebook that led us to this amazing falafel place. We showed up at the door and guess what? It was closed. Well, we just looked for the next restaurant on the street, and guess what? It was closed too. Restaurant after restaurant for the next 45 minutes, all were closed. And I finally turn and I look at Andy and I say, Andy, we're idiots. It's Ramadan. There aren't any restaurants that are open. Everyone's fasting. So dejected, we're sitting on the curb in Amman looking for strange granola bars that we picked up in Cambodia. When this older gentleman in his early 60s approaches us and says without missing a beat, you're looking for food, aren't you? <laughs> the story continues with a sneaky meal that he brings us to in a small spot in the local mall. After that, we go sightseeing with our new friend and we end the evening breaking fast with 3,000 Muslim men at an iftar celebration. We actually ended the night smoking hookah with Muhammad and meeting his family and learning about what it means to, to live as a Palestinian, Palestinian refugee in diaspora. And when we offered him payment for all the sightseeing, for driving us around, for the food, for the experience, he declined, simply saying, it's Ramadan. Kindness to strangers. It forever shaped and changed me, this encounter I had with Muhammad. I view the world differently. I view the struggle of Palestinians differently. I view being hungry differently. And I view, and I view the impact we can make simply by starting with the with the Imago Day, the same way that Muhammad saw us. Our ability to be kind not only shapes us, but it is also a witness to others. And so when people speak about this church, wouldn't it be amazing if they said before anything else, before saying the choir is amazing, which it is, before even saying our children's ministry is wonderful, which it is, before they even say the senior minister is really cool, <laughs> before they say anything about this church, they say First Church is filled with really kind people. Is there a better witness that we could have as a church than to be a church filled with really kind people. 
Could we be known for anything more important than our kindness? As we live lives in a world that is filled with violence and hate and we navigate through the waters of scarcity and selfishness, we are being called, make no mistake, we are being called to live a different life. That's how the gospel works. So friends, as we claim the identity we are given at our baptism, affirmed in our faithful response to the good news of Jesus Christ, as we work our way through this series of finding out what it means to be members of this church and how we will flourish as we go out into the world, I invite you to see the power that exists, the real power, the transformational power that exists in kindness. And as we work to transform ourselves and others, I want to encourage you that before you throw up your hands in defeat and think the words of Jesus this morning are indeed impossible, let's simply start with being kind to one another. Because it's this kindness, this radical kindness that points us and others to the ongoing reign of God and the ways in which God is working to make all things new. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, it is easy to turn inward. We don't know why you created a world where there is so much violence and hate. We're not at liberty to understand the inner workings of our soul. But we do know that it is easy for us to live in a world that exists solely for ourselves. And if we're honest, we know that it is easy to be unkind in an increasingly dangerous world. But convict us this morning. Spark within us an ability to see beyond ourselves and beyond situation. Help us to put into practice the words we hear this morning. And while we will ultimately fall short of loving our enemies as deeply and as thoroughly as you instruct us to, we know that we can take one small step towards that goal by simply being kind. So help us to be kind, not only to one another, but also to those we meet outside of these walls. For we trust what the gospel says, that for you, nothing is impossible. And from even the smallest of things, you make incredible things happen. May that change start with us and within our hearts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.